Welcome, everyone. We're so excited to kickstart our Alaska's Path to a Prosperous Future uh, webinar today. We have all of you here with us, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. This visionary panel uh, constitutes some of Alaska's most innovative economic leaders who will share concrete examples of how they're building resilient, equitable, and sustainable economic initiatives across our state. Uh, we're so glad that you've joined us to not only learn more about these ventures, but also more about upcoming action opportunities and ways to get involved with a collaborative economic vision coalition and to build our journey towards a prosperous future for Alaska. Shivaik isinch ijich u den ina kanaga shilkun kanash, chakyang ashlinish itich u shidiznaka heather kendo miller shimta, ch u wide miller stupta, ch u dhekak shugu ya studa, ch u chak uh chikinak yetal hanun bagu tiakliat sette. Um my English name is Ruth Miller, my dena ina name is Chivaik Isen, and I'm a member of the Chakyang tribe of Dillingham. Uh, my Dena Ina ancestors also called these areas our homelands here in Dekhayekak, now known as Anchorage. We ask you to take this moment to thank the traditional and current stewards of the lands that you call home. Across Alaska and this continent, our natural spaces have only been preserved because of the ancestral imperative, the cultural beauty, and the determined commitment of Indigenous peoples. It's thanks to their caretaking, knowledge, stories, languages, and generosity that we are able to build relationships with these lands today. And we express our gratitude together that these lands and waters have been guarded and protected for millennia. And as we all enjoy and are nourished by these lands and waters today, we must also commit to their protection and work to preserve their health and wealth for generations to come, which is what brings us together today. I'm very excited to introduce my co-MC, Margie Wyshevsky. Thank you so much, Ruth. Such a joy to be able to um, host this space with you and um, such a joy to see so many um, familiar and new faces joining us here on Zoom today. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to invite everyone to introduce yourself, your name and your community in the chat so we can get to know who all is here. Uh, we hope that this, uh, is just the beginning of a conversation and so really invite you into building that with us and excited to share with you all um, some of the great work um, from our many partners and collaborators. And so first off, want to thank our co-hosts, um, the Alaska Climate Alliance, Alaska Version 3, First Entrepreneur Alaska, Alaska Solar Energy Industry Association, Arctic Solar Ventures, Native Movement, Pacific Environment, Alaska Longline, Fishermen's Association, Alaska Conservation Foundation, Alaska Farmers Market Association, Alaska Pacific University, Buy Alaska, Trout Unlimited Alaska, and Alaska Food Hub. I also want to thank Alyssa Quinton for the gorgeous artwork that we've been using to uplift and outreach about this event. And um, you can find um, more of her work online. And with that, I'll um, pass it back to Ruth for some logistics. Mm -hmm. As we move through our webinar, please write your questions for panelists in the chat box. Uh, we'll have someone keeping an eye on those to moderate those. Um, and we'll use this tool for question and answer section near the end of our time together. Uh, this webinar will be, it is being recorded and currently live streamed. Um, and so we do that ask that as you listen to our panelists, you remain muted so that we prevent any background noise. And I think those are all of our logistics for now. Feel free to join us on video. Um, that's always welcome so that we're not all stuck in Zoom isolation. It's always great to see your faces. Awesome. And also thanks to behind the scenes um, tech support, Tara. Um, you can go ahead and stop the screen share for a moment. I'm going to um, just share verbally some of the context for what has motivated um, us coming together today. And so really, um, this is in response to the opportunities that we see as Alaska and the world are changing quickly. And the energy transition specifically is already underway, which means big changes for us and especially Alaska's economy. And meanwhile, Alaskans are leading with innovative solutions. And so we're here today to share some of those with you. And we hope you'll be as inspired by them as we are because there's a ton happening right now. And really that this prosperous economy and bright future is alive and well now. And so as we continue to uplift and invest in these examples, uh, we can expedite that transition. And so in the um, 
hour and a half that we'll be here together, we're going to look at the existing businesses, sectors, and stories that really demonstrate a prosperous path forward for our state. And this conversation is urgent um, for us as Alaskans because um, this is a time to come together or get left behind. And there's no doubt that climate change is already affecting our economy. We see the floods and landslides and fires and coastal erosion and infrastructure failure and declining fisheries, among other effects that people are experiencing firsthand. And um, the melting glaciers, thawing permafrost, disappearing sea ice, all lead into those positive feedback loops that many of us are very well familiar with accelerating climate change across the world, but especially amplified here in the northern parts of our home. And so uh, specifically, want to focus on how effective action to limit global temperature rise well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels um, needs to begin immediately um, with dramatic greenhouse gas reductions across economic sectors. And the opportunity for clean and affordable energy um, to be available to all of us. And it's good for our pocketbooks, it's good for the planet. And one of the best ways to achieve this is to accelerate um, Alaska's transition to renewable energy. So that'll be one of the first series of speakers that we hear about, um, but first wanted to pass to Ruth to share a little bit more framing too. Yeah, I mean, just transition is not only inevitable, but it's something that we have already embraced as Alaskans and, and have to continue to, to be ambitious in the way that we implement just transition principles throughout our economy and, and our Alaska community. I mean, we as Alaskans are already plenty familiar with the sentiment of fierce independence and self-sufficiency and resilience. Uh, we know the feeling of hard, dark winters, but we also understand that hard work and dedication see us through until the light returns. So in the midst of the context of a global pandemic, of a massive global climate crisis that is only accelerating, we also know that change is within our grasp and that we have the opportunity to, to rise above the chaos and to lead uh, the path forward, informed by the places that Alaska has been already. Now is our chance to seize the burgeoning opportunities of a changing world and to grow in better alignment towards the Alaska that we want to see. One built on justice, real food security, access to broadband, clean energy, and quality jobs. A just transition for Alaska, again, is inevitable, and we now have the opportunity to ride this changing tide. We can lead the clean energy revolution here at home while building sovereignty and stability for Alaska's economy for future generations. With the guidance and cultural wealth and knowledge of Alaska's first stewards, our Native peoples, we can see a path forward that is sustainable, equitable, and builds a thriving economy. So we're so excited to pass the mic off to uh, today's speakers to walk us through their inspiring work and to help us envision a path forward for our state. So beautifully said. Uh, so it's my joy to introduce Mark Foster with MAFA Consulting and Aaron McKittrick, who's a local utility board member. They'll be speaking about Alaska's renewable energy future. Thank you, Margie. Alaska has a vast natural resource endowment of clean renewable energy resources that could be tapped to transmit uh, basically the transformation to a renewable energy future. The scale is so large, people sometimes sort of underestimate it. Alaska's natural renewable energy resource endowment is three times larger than the entire United States energy consumption today. It's huge. The benefits of accelerating a transition to develop those natural resources uh, include jobs, lower energy prices, higher energy security with local resources, and the potential for those renewable resources to provide electric heat to buildings and hydrogen-based fuels across the transportation sector, including the marine and aviation sectors. And so there's a a lot of opportunity to transition away from fossil fuels toward renewables, given our vast endowment. Indeed, Alaska's historically high and, uh, and volatile fossil fuel prices have been moderated by the successful development of renewable energy resources across the state. Hydro projects dating back to the 1890s, coming forward to a number of uh, hydro projects across the state. I want to just point out one that I think is uh, quite noteworthy. Kodiak Electric 
is 95% clean renewable between its hydro and wind resources. We've got additional wind projects in uh, across the rail belt and in Western Alaska with Alaska Village Electric Cooperative. Solar projects are now coming online with Matanuska Electric and Homer Electric Association. And Homer and Matanuska are looking at battery storage in addition to Golden Valley. Huge opportunities are beginning to be developed. As the fossil fuel prices continue to escalate in Alaska and frequently two and three and four times higher than the United States, renewable energy looks increasingly attractive and is well poised to replace legacy fossil fuel energy systems as we look out at the 2025 to 2050 time horizon. It will provide greater energy security, increased resiliency, a broad set of environmental, economic, and health benefits, and the potential to generate thousands of new construction and operating jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one thing I thought was interesting is last fall, I was at a presentation by Ingemar Matheson, who's done all kinds of innovative energy projects in the Northwest Arctic, including solar and heat pumps. And he talked about energy harvest season up there in the Arctic, and that even there, there was this season you could harvest sun and heat. And I really like that harvest analogy because that's what renewable energy is, it's harvested. We don't extract it, we don't import it. And if you harvest it, you can keep getting it year after year from the same local source. And on the flip side, you also have to find those good harvest locations, deal with that seasonality and figure out how to store this harvested energy for later, which isn't simple, but it is becoming easier and cheaper. Outside the rail belt, high diesel prices have always provided a huge incentive to go renewable. Um, we've already heard about Kodiak. This, a lot of the Southeast is also very renewable, but there are places like tiny little Kagiganak in Western Alaska that's managed to get nearly 50% renewable energy without access to hydro. And so there's a lot of really exciting innovation. The rail belt has kind of been behind the curve, which is mostly because natural gas used to be cheap in South Central Alaska, but it's not anymore. Uh, costs to just to burn the gas to make power are about eight cents a kilowatt hour. And you have to add on top of that, all of the costs of getting the electricity to people. And that's tripled in a couple decades. And Increasingly, other renewable sources are getting much cheaper, which is we're poised at this really exciting time of great opportunity where more renewable energy is possible on a meaningful scale. And the first thing I want to highlight is batteries. So in 2003, Fairbanks, Golden Valley Electric had the biggest battery in the world. Uh, last year, down on the Kenai Peninsula, we built a battery more than 14 times that size. And the actual biggest battery in the world is now in California and it's 17 times bigger than that. So this has been a dramatic increase in our technological ability as those have gotten bigger and cheaper and it has cascading effects on everything. They don't make energy, batteries don't, but they're key because they can react quickly. Um, down on the Kenai, Homer Electric primarily built the battery for resilience and reliability and saving fuel so we don't have to idle a gas plant in certain conditions. But now we have it and that quick reaction time means that you can more easily integrate sources of energy that vary with time, like wind and solar. Um, it was already mentioned that Matanuska, they have a solar farm contract just got signed within the last month or so for 6.7 cents a kilowatt hour, which is cheaper than the gas that Matanuska otherwise burns in their power plant. And that same company has been talking to Homer Electric. And so that's solar in Alaska, cheaper than gas. Um, 
the same time, there's a lot of wind exploration going on down on the Kenai Peninsula and across the state, which could even be cheaper than solar. And so looking at the jobs in the future, Alaska, even the rail belt grid is very small in the grand scheme of the United States or the world, which means it hasn't attracted a lot of outside attention, which is partly puts us behind the curve and partly means that this is really a homegrown effort. Pretty much all those companies, the solar, the wind, all the independent power producers are Alaska companies. All the utilities are municipal or cooperative or nonprofit, you know, run by Alaska citizens. And I think that's a really exciting for our transition to the future. Thank you. Awesome. That is so heartening. It's so good to hear from both of you, Mark and Aaron. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It's clear that regenerative economic activity is already happening in diverse economic sectors across Alaska. It's amazing to me the spread of different place-based efforts that are happening across our state. And here we want to garner support for these efforts so they can continue to expand and grow more jobs that renew and restore people on the planet. Like we were discussing, renewable and sustainable sectors include a plethora of different ideas and initiatives across our state. And one in particular that is so exciting to me in particular is uh, mariculture. Inspiring folks are working to grow mariculture into $100 million industry per year for 20 years to reach 1 billion in 30 years. Today we'll hear from an emerging ocean kelp farming industry in Prince William Sound. And I wanted to take a moment to uh, honor and uplift the work of Dune Lankard of Native Conservancy, who unfortunately couldn't be with us in person today, but by using Dune's own words to describe the vision and work of Native Conservancy's ocean kelp farming, quote, we need to jumpstart a region-wide and eventually statewide Alaska restorative kelp initiative that brings native tribal members, women, youth, and fishermen together to help restore the ocean and to learn how to grow traditional sea vegetables and to help us get this new ocean industry off the ground. Besides, we don't have to build high-speed boats that burn enormous amounts of fossil fuels chasing kelp around, and we don't have to feed it, water it, or fertilize it, just care for it. So we've dropped some links uh, in the chat about that work. And I'm so excited to hear from Sky Starrett's of Noble Ocean Farms to present on a building grassroots mariculture community in Alaska. Thank you, Ruth. Hi, everyone. My name is Sky. I live on Eak land. I was first invited to this region by Dune. And I'm really glad that we took a moment to acknowledge his leadership in this sector. He's the one who encouraged and supported my partner and I in becoming kelp farmers. And before I dive in, when I use the word mariculture in this presentation, I'm referring to seaweed and shellfish farming in the ocean. And kelp is a type of seaweed, which we sometimes refer to as sea vegetables or sea greens. In 2019, Dune shared his vision for how mariculture could be a healing force. Many families that we know here in Cordova struggle with accessing enough healthy produce and vegetables. I'm sure many of you uh, in rural Alaska understand this. It costs so much money to buy greens in the grocery stores and especially in the winter, which impacts our nutritional intake. Um, by farming kelp, we can directly increase food security for Alaskans. That's why we're so passionate about it. Kelp is a superfood that is excellent for our bodies and has significant benefits for the planet. Our goal at Noble Ocean Farms is to provide communities throughout Alaska with flavorful, uh, nutrient dense and locally produced sea vegetables. Kelp again is really rich in vitamins, minerals, and it's extremely versatile uh, in home cooking. Some of the ways that we enjoy cooking with kelp are wrapping fish in kelp to keep the moisture uh, retained and also to infuse it with umami flavors. Uh, you can cut kelp into thin strips and use it as pasta. We like to also cut it into bite-sized pieces and, and put it in our stir fries, in our scrambles. You can essentially use kelp uh, as a substitute for any other green vegetable. Um, Kelp can also be the basis for many soups and stews. Uh, most folks know about miso soup, but 
Um, we also really like using kelp and chowder. My, my favorite dish that we've made so far is uh, halibut and kelp chowder. Um, and eating kelp has remarkable health benefits. As many of you know, native people have used kelp as a medicine for thousands of years. Kelp strengthens the immune system. It improves thyroid functioning, lowers blood pressure and purifies the arteries. But the best part is it's healing for the ocean as well. Kelp sequesters carbon and counteracts ocean acidification. It provides habitat for fish like herring and salmon in critical life cycle stages. So the kelp not only acts as a nursery and a refugia for the fish, but it also provides an important food source for hundreds of marine animals. We are honored to be part of the growing grassroots mariculture community here in Alaska. And we wanna see mariculture become a thriving, diverse cooperative sector that supports Alaska's just transition. Thank you to the facilitators and the co-hosts for making this webinar happen. I really appreciate the work of um, the Alaska Climate Alliance Native Movement and everyone else who is devoted to Alaska's just transition. Thank you so much, Sky. Absolutely. I mean, producing local food, maintaining subsistence lifestyles, sustaining wild food systems, all vital for our food security and our food sovereignty. There's tremendous growth in farming across Alaska, and this is such a wonderful example. I am definitely more hungry than when the Zoom started. But all of this new farming is largely driven uh, by an increase in the growing season due to climate change, as well as USDA subsidies for greenhouse high tunnels that further extend the growing season. Uh, so this is a great way to not only um, ease the impacts and ease the acceleration of climate change through carbon sequestration like kelp farming offers us, but also to make sure that as we deal with the changing Alaska, we can ensure greater food security for our people. It's a high priority given Alaska's geographic isolation and our longstanding food supply vulnerabilities, which are being compounded by state budget cuts that have affected the agriculture and transportation sectors. And as I'm sure we've all noticed with uh, the empty shelves in our grocery stores, recent disruptions to food supply chains from COVID-19. Local food systems are the key to achieving food security in Alaska. So many of us, of course, already supplement store-bought food with hunting, fishing, gardening, berry picking, and other harvesting. And it's so important to remember that as we uh, are prideful of our unique ways of life, we uh, hold in our hearts that these were first taught by our Alaska Native cultures. And these are strengths that we as a, a contemporary Alaska community can build on. Um, our Native cultures teach us deep reciprocity and respect for the lands, plants, and animals. And our connection as Native peoples is, is beyond food, but instead intertwines us in a web of interdependency and deep relationship. In an effort towards forming Alaska's food sovereignty, let's support tribes enacting their sovereign rights to transform the mechanisms and policies of food production, distribution, and consumption. Indigenous stewardship of Alaskan lands and waters is vital to maintain our subsistence ways of life, which we all know and love. Uh, it's vital to sustain wild food systems and to restore sacred connections to the relatives, uh, our more than human kin, who give their lives to sustain our own. I'm so excited to hear Robbie Mixon speaking more deeply on food sovereignty in Alaska, representing the Alaska Food Hub and the Alaska Food Policy Council. Thank you so much, Robbie, for being here with us. Hi, um, thanks for having me today. I'm Robbie Mixon. I'm the local foods director at Cook Inlet Keeper um, and the executive director for the Alaska Food Policy Council. Um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about um, food hubs and what's happening in the state with them. Um, so there are over 400 food hubs across the country with six um, in Alaska and more in planning stages. So essentially um, a food hub is a centralized location or a facility that um, helps in the distribution of local and regional foods. Um, and they can help disrupt the globalized food system by building in more local control of our food, as well as creating greater diversity and resilience within our Alaskan food system. 
They come in all shapes and sizes, depending on the place-based needs of the communities that they serve. Some provide um, transportation of food, some provide cold storage um, and processing. They uh, conduct collective marketing um, and outreach amongst uh, many other things. In 2016, Cook and Lit Keeper opened the Alaska Food Hub, which serves Homer, Soldatna, Soldovia, and Nilchik. In the Nilchik, we offer a range of 100% locally sourced, grown and produced foods like oysters, fresh produce, coffee, baked goods, and even seaweed pickles and salsa. So Sky, we can't wait to add Noble Ocean Farms to the equation. Um, we've even worked with state agencies to allow the sale of cottage food online. That's a first for the state. Um, and now I'd like to share a short video explaining how the Alaska Food Hub works. The Alaska Food Hub is your online local foods connection, featuring 100% locally grown and harvested produce, seafood, and much more. The Food Hub is like a virtual farmer's market, and the process is both simple and easy. Each week, producers list items for sale on the online marketplace. Product availability changes weekly and with the season. Once the ordering cycle is open, Simply log on to the online marketplace and place items you'd like to buy in your cart. A confirmation email lets you know when and where to pick up your items. Return any time during the ordering cycle to add more items. Producers deliver all ordered products to a central location where items are sorted and inspected for quality. Customers then pick up their orders and the cycle begins again. The Alaska Food Hub, we make local easy. Like I said, um, food hubs can come in many different shapes and sizes, and I wanted to let you guys know um, a few ways to get involved if you're interested. Um, if you are in Anchorage or in the Matsu, um, Arctic Harvest Delivery is an excellent choice, as is Catch 49 for local seafood, and they also um, serve customers in Fairbanks as well. So people down in Southeast, you should check out the Salt and Soil Marketplace. And folks in Kodiak, um, the Kodiak Harvest Co-op um, is a wonderful option, um, as is a new food hub that's opening up um, this spring under uh, the Aluktuk Gr Grown Program. Um, it is a all a native-led food hub. So check them out at alukedatgrown.com. Um, I also wanted to share with you the Alaska Farmers Market, um, Directory of Farmers Markets, Farm Stands, and CSAs, and you can find that at alaskafarmersmarkets.org. Um, we also have a virtual Alaska Food Festival and Conference coming up March 17th through the 19th, um, and we'd love to see you there. So thanks so much for having me. Um, today and learning more about food hubs. Uh, another rapidly expanding sector whose success is um, primed to build on is regenerative tourism. And as we've seen the pandemic's ongoing impacts to the cruise industry, it really highlights the importance of independent tourists to Alaska. And many of these people come to Alaska seeking adventure in wild and scenic places and um, their, their engagement can really be uh, part of helping build out this um, future economy for Alaska. Locally owned businesses and tour operators that provide independent tourist opportunities for outdoor recreation and connection with diverse Alaskan cultures help keep profits in Alaska and are more likely to benefit communities than industrial tourism. And visitors to our state can um, help create alternatives to resource extraction uh, through the jobs and um, also proactively improve the ecosystems, elevate local economies, promote meaningful and responsible visitor experiences, etc. So um, we're really excited to uplift this homegrown Alaskan tourist tourism industry um, that's investing in community led solutions that protect, enable and grow strategies that benefit the communities and cultures and ecosystems of Alaska. So it's with great joy I introduce Mary Goddard, who's a regional catalyst at Allen Marine, and here is here to talk to us about how Alaska is an emerging global leader in regenerative tourism. 
Hello, uh, everyone. Okay, I'm unmuted. Hope you guys can all hear me. Um, yeah, thank you guys for continuously making space for this after that great disruption. I'm going to try to gather myself and hope that I can share um, eloquently. So please let me know if you guys have any questions, put them in the chat. We'll also add some links in the chat as well. So just to kind of go over, um, although I'm with Alan Marine and Sea Alaska Corp, I'm part of a bigger uh, network called the Sustainable Southeast Partnership. And this network includes tribal governments, community-minded organizations, local business, native corporations, and entities, culture bearers, educators, state and federal agencies, and much more. Um, so there are regenerative tourism uh, description, or um, how we said it is, regenerative tourism is a holistic approach to tourism that proactively works to improve ecosystems, elevate local economies, and promote meaningful and responsible visitor experiences. Local, authentic um, representation, deep community involvement, and practical and innovative steps for conserving and enhancing the environment are central to this approach. Regenerative tourism reveals how the industry can protect, enable, and grow strategies that benefit communities, cultures, and ecosystems of Southeast Alaska. And of course, you know, the conversation goes beyond just Southeast Alaska. I think it's more on a statewide level and even a, um, at a national level at this point. Um, so it's really fun to be part of this conversation because I feel like with Southeast Alaska, really having several rural communities that we work within, um, you know, it, it's so tied to every industry, the visitor industry. And so as you, can build upon these other um, economies, regenerative economies, and make them um, good for communities. It also supports our tourism industry. So when we're looking at regenerative tourism, for us, um, especially in communities that tourism is not happening, it's about getting in front of tourism, not letting it just happen to us, but helping shape it and set boundaries on how we want tourism to be. And so I just wanted to share a little bit of the, um, instead of just one project, I was just gonna kind of go over a couple of um, programs and projects that we're doing at the Sustainable Southeast Partnership. And so through this work, one is the Indigenous Stewards Program. Um, another, you know, we just kind of talked in length about the food and trying to um, localize it. Um, so we did a lot of efforts in food fellowship catalyst programs. So I'll drop the link in there so you can read about that as well. And then currently what we're working pretty hard on is um, the Build Back Better EDA program. And, uh, you know, it's a forest products cluster is what we received the grant for. And um, really it's about reshaping the forest products industry and really making sure that what we're doing with our forestry products is that we're localizing it. And so anything that we can localize is gonna really help our communities um, fill that gap from the summer season to the winter season and making sure that we have strong workforce development in each of our communities. And um, it's really exciting just to see how all of this, you know, all of the work at a community level really fits into tourism, you know, and offers an authentic experience. Um, it bridges that gap for the workforce development between seasons. Um, and it just, um, it, it's just a, a really, I guess I'm kind of at a loss for words, like a really cool um, connection. So another project we're working on is sharing the website, visit southeastalaska.com. And really this website is really meant to provide assets for our small businesses that are trying to promote their tourism business and then also set up the correct messaging that we wanna be leaders in regenerative tourism and that we're doing things um, to promote that. Um, this year it was really great for the Path to Prosperity boot camp through Spruce Root. The whole focus was on regenerative tourism. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pop a few links in the chat. Please copy and paste them. Check it out when you guys get a chance. And just and 
feel like there's a, a lot of information here, but I look forward to questions and seeing you guys, um, you know, hearing what you guys have to say. So thank you for listening. And I, I'm, uh, Margie, I'm not able to pop this in the chat. So maybe I can um, somehow send it to you and you can post that. Yeah, absolutely. This academy takes local young adults who are interested in getting into the sport fishing industry in some form and allows them to have a week experience learning how to fly fish, tie flies, cast a fly line, as well as learn customer service skills and uh, conservation skills and basically the mentality around that surrounds the sport fishing industry. If it applies to fly fishing, they learn it. If you need any dry flies, mice patterns, leeches, smolts. Then we let them put what they've got to work. So client A is essentially the final exam of the Guide Academy. So all week we've been teaching them how to fly fish. We've taught them about customer service, safety, and today they'll put all those new skills to the test and they'll be expected to guide a member of the community that they've never met before for a safe and fun day out on the water. It's a good day out. We're, we're going to be catching some rainbows. It's all free to the students. Yep, it is. And uh, it's well paid off the minute I see one of them out on the river fishing while I'm out there guiding during the summer. It's awesome. They are absolutely uniquely qualified to be the next generation of guides. They were born and raised here. They know the stories from their ancestors. They can tell you why the caribou migrate, where they migrate, when they migrate, what, when, when the seals are gonna be coming through. Th those are all things that it takes a lifetime of living here to learn. And uh, you know, when you have guides coming from the lower 48, even though they're marvelous and very knowledgeable about fly fishing, they have a whole lot to learn about the area. The thing is, I never, had that idea of becoming a fly fishing ga guide when I was a child. You know, I, I grew up commercial fishing. I mean, everyone commercial fishes, and it's not it's not even a question. So, once I was introduced to the academy, it kind of created that dream of oh, you know, there's something different. I you know, this is awesome. I want to come out here and be able to fish every day with new people. So now now that it's actually happened, it's it's incredible. Yeah, after I came here, I fell in love with fishing and everything that goes into a lodge, like the management, um, hospitality everything like that. I wouldn't want to be in an office or anything. <laughs> well, being like one of the three girls at the academy, it was kind of cool because you could just try to keep up with the boys too. And it wasn't that hard. Learning that I get to fly out to all these remote places in a place I love and being able to help people catch trophy fish that a lot of people in the world don't get to do is just something I find amazing. Um, and now we're going to be traveling geographically from the Bristol Bay region to the Aleutians. Our next speaker will be sharing about how producing green hydrogen ener with renewable energy is a big opportunity on the horizon for Alaska. So this is an emerging alternative fuel that could transform the global shipping and aviation industries. And the Aleutian Islands specifically have abundant renewable resources, such as tidal, geothermal, and wind that could be used to produce green hydrogen from in a way that doesn't uh, produce carbon emissions. And they're located on the shipping routes between the west coast of the US um, and Asia, as well as the increasing um, northern sea route near Russia. And so um, this provides a market for, um, for the fuels um, for the ships serving these routes, as well as the possibility of bulk exports of hydrogen to domestic and Asian markets. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, introduce Paul Foos, who's the former Commissioner of Commerce and Economic Development development. So uh, what we're talking about here, I've been working on a, a study here that's going to be out in a couple of weeks and we can send it to all the participants, but it's on producing hydrogen uh, using stranded energy in the Aleutian Islands. So the reason it's stranded, and you know, we know we've got geothermal out there, we've got tidal, we've got wind. The reason it's called stranded is because there aren't that many people living there. So there isn't that much local use for it. Well, now, because of moving to a non-carbon world, making a transition, and that's important. It's a transition, it's not going to be an overnight thing, uh, but it has to be practical. So hydrogen is a big part of that. And 
in order to make hydrogen, there's two ways. You can steam reform uh, petroleum products and get it. That's the way most of it is done right now. But that's called blue hydrogen. If you want green hydrogen, you're going to have to use completely renewable sources. And so that's what's uh, available out on the Aleutian Islands. And uh, when you have electricity like this, and we're talking about being able to produce it at a cost of about three and a half to six cents a kilowatt hour. Well, right now in Anchorage, we're paying 19 cents. So, uh, you know, if you don't have to pay for your distribution costs and everything else and can put it straight into industrial applications, it's very efficient. And so when you uh, take water and you apply electricity to it, it liberates the oxygen and the hydrogen. So what hydrogen is used as uh, is as a uh, uh, first, uh, you can make alternative fuels with it. And right now there's a lot of efforts on the Northern Sea Route and, and other shipping in general to reduce the carbon footprint, but you have to have a realistic fuel to do it. Hydrogen by itself just takes up so much space to store it that uh, you take up your whole ship with just the fuel tank. So anyway, the uh, what has been built already in uh, Finland and Norway, they're taking hydrogen and they're combining it with nitrogen, which makes ammonia. And ammonia is a really good fuel uh, that there's a good liquid fuel that can be used on a ship. So the other thing that you can use it for is you can use it to make steel, make iron ore. And right now it's has, you have to use coal and you every think, you know, you hear of Coke, that just coal that's been burned and like it, a huge like charcoal briquettes. And so they put the iron ore in there and it pulls all the oxygen out of the iron ore to make CO2. That's the problem. So if you put hydrogen with it and apply it to it, uh, it uh, makes H2O, which is water, pure water. So there really is no pollution from the process and you end up with really pure steel. And uh, it's really sought after by a lot of these uh, steel uh, manufacturing companies because they're trying to recycle it. So uh, in terms of recycling steel, every time you recycle it, there's a little degradation of the quality. There might be some plastic that got in there or something. So they want the super high grade steel. So right now steel is being recycled about nine times a steel molecule fuel. It's being recycled more than anything else on the planet. But this helps. So I've identified four sites out there and it, it takes uh, access to the energy, but you also have to have a deep water port site. So I'm evaluating all of those. And, uh, you know, it's uh, along with the uh, provisions in the Energy Act that Lisa Murkowski got passed in 2020 and some aspects of the uh, infrastructure bill that got passed it looks like there's going to be some funding for projects like this. So that's what my pre-feasibility work is aimed at, is to uh, you know show people the potentials here for this so that we can start uh, producing this. Um, uh, next, we are going to switch gears to uplift entrepreneurial efforts to support expanded accessible broadband. And I'm so excited uh, to bring in Brittany Woods Orison uh, to take us through some discussion of expanding broadband internet across Alaska. Affordable access to broadband in every household is needed to realize Alaska's full potential. Investing in broadband honestly pays for itself. It creates opportunities and lowers the cost for our families, which means uh, access to telemedicine, education educational opportunities for kids, remote workers, reduced travel costs, and more. A 1% increase in Alaskans' ability to access faster internet could grow our Alaska state economy by $67.7 million and create 1,890 new jobs or more. A new federal funding that has just passed recently has the potential to greatly expand this infrastructure, which would support entrepreneurial activity and business throughout the state. So Brittany, you are so welcome in this space. We're so excited to hear from you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this new, exciting uh, broadband. I have only been in this position for five months. And in that short time, I have connected with so many amazing advocates. And there's so many people who are doing the important work. And this is a really great time to tap in and see what you can do and your community could do for yourself to demand better broadband. Um, the Infrastructure Act that passed has a lot of 
exciting things within it to ensure that we focus on universal access. The two critical elements being funding for unserved regions, meaning they have no broadband, no internet, and also financial assistance for people who cannot afford full costs. Uh, other rules include internet service providers required to have low cost options, um, no, no digital redlining, no longer being able, uh, organizations being able to deny building out because they don't see it as profitable. And the 65 billion that is for broadband in the Infrastructure Act is broken down into various things, such as the Broadband Equity Access and Development Program, meaning 100 million for each state. And I really want to bring out the language that is being used that is really focusing on making sure everyone has access. There's also the Digital Equity Competitive Grant Program, which is $2.75 billion, and another Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program, which is another $2 billion for our Indigenous nations. And what will ensure that we do this accurately is this funding is not accessible until there is more accurate mapping and we can know which communities do not have access and who needs it. And they, there's a lot of initiatives for crowdsourcing and bringing in more people. And this is already happening within the state as I have pictured is the Akiak community who has worked with Pacific Data Port and Microcom to bring in their own broadband 5G, really fast speeds with satellite technology. They were able to use ARPA funds and their 2.5 gigahertz spectrum license and spectrum can be understood as like the radio waves, a uh, river in the sky. Uh, with that, they were able to take on this project with $600,000, which is extremely, not extremely, more affordable in the broadband world when other technologies can cost up to $125,000 per mile. Uh, with that said, this um, there's a lot of opportunities and I'll put my email in the chat. I'm really trying to connect with more people and I want people to go away with understanding not having access to reliable, affordable internet is unjust. We can no longer tolerate not having this essential infrastructure in our state. Once every Alaskan is offered the ability to engage in the global digital economy, our state will flourish in ways not seen before. So. Thank you for your time and everyone for being so amazing during this uh, webinar. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, it is so clear that broadband is an important lever to accelerate Alaska's economic transition in a great way uh, to introduce the opportunities and challenges section of our conversation today. Workforce development is another uh, lever that can really smooth the shift away from resource extraction and ensure that Alaskans have good paying jobs and healthy livelihoods so we can take care of our families and each other. And this is such a pivotal moment in history um, and an economic diversification in Alaska can be a great way to ensure that um, we can do this transition well, focusing especially on the workers. Um, impacted most by the pandemic and climate change and other economic shocks. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker who will show us how communities impacted by imp uh, economic transitions can be reinvigorated with investment in high quality job creation and retooling and conversion of infrastructure and reclamation and remediation of closed facilities. Specifically, uh, Ryan will be speaking about workforce development and renewable energy solutions. He is the um, assistant business manager for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. 1547 and I'll pass it to you Ryan thanks for being with us. All right thanks so much Margie and thank you to uh, Ruth and everyone else um, tech support and everyone who's helping out with this uh, fantastic zoom webinar and I'm really really excited to follow up um, I think it's a great um, segue from Brittany's presentation to um, what I'm going to talk about today which is uh, workforce development so um, so yeah, Ryan Andrew is my name. Uh, I work for the IBEW, um, which stands for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And uh, we represent workers all across Alaska, um, not just electrical workers, but uh, primarily, you know, what we focus on are uh, training um, for electricians, uh, journeyman electricians, journeyman power linemen, and uh, journeyman telecommunications workers. Um, around the state. So, um, you know, 
really our foundation for those uh, particular trades is in our apprenticeship program. That's kind of our, um, you know, it's a, one of the things that's most important and near and dear to our industry is uh, our jointly managed apprenticeship program. And the way that that works is it's a, it's a joint apprenticeship between the IBW, which is the labor union representing the workers, um, and our contractor partners with uh, the National Electrical Contractors Association. Um, and so how that works in practice is that we uh, we bring folks in and we train them. Um, they're they're getting paid. They're uh, on the job working, getting experience, and they come to an actual classroom. We've got two facilities uh, here in Anchorage and in Fairbanks uh, where we do the classroom component of the training. And uh, so the combination of on the job training plus the classroom um, training, they really what what we end up with at the end of their apprenticeship is a one of the best trained journeymen. Um, in the industry. And so, um, you know, workforce development is, is, like I said, near and dear to us and our apprenticeships are a really important um, piece of that and, and how we create those journeymen to be able to fill the jobs um, in, the, in the energy sectors. Um, and so another, another thing I'll mention just on that note, um, kind of some ways that workforce development and our apprenticeships can be supported and, and creating those jobs and uh, creating those journeymen um, are through things such as uh, project labor agreements or community workforce agreements. Those are uh, fantastic ways on the construction level that we can um, you know, provide requirements for apprentices and making sure that we uh, have apprentices working on those um, projects. So, um, you know, one thing I'll, I'll mention also, because I think it's really, really critical in the training um, and even before folks get into those apprenticeship um, jobs is a couple of programs that we're really proud to partner with and that's um, Alaska Works Partnership. They do a, a phenomenal, uh, what we call a pre-apprenticeship. And so that uh, allows um, folks, they've got, you know, several different classes um, for uh, recruiting for veterans who are interested in uh, learning trades, uh, women who are interested in learning trades, um, and just anyone who's, who's interested in, in the trades in general, um, that they can come in and get a little bit of training ahead of time. Um, on the note about uh, veterans, uh, we're also really, really proud of um, a program between the IBW and the uh, NECA, uh, which is the National Electrical Contractors Association um, called the Veterans Electrical Entry Program. And part of that uh, program, what it's designed for is to allow for uh, transitioning veterans who are coming out of the um, service to get into um, you know, direct entry spots in those apprenticeship programs. Um, and we're really, really proud of that. We've had really good success with that program. Um, in addition to another uh, that you may have heard about called uh, Helmets to Hard Hats, which is another program for transitioning veterans and it kind of is designed to give them that pathway and, and um, make sure that they know the opportunity exists when they uh, exit the service. Um, so specifically on the renewable and clean energy sector, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that we do um, as well in getting that workforce ready. Uh, part of our electrician apprenticeship involves uh, a component of uh, solar volt photovoltaic installation, so solar panel installations, um, and you know code requirements that um, our journeymen and apprentices are going to need to be familiar with um, when they're following the National Electrical Code uh, on those projects. In addition, and this is something relatively new for our program, but we um, also decided to incorporate the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program. Um, that's a curriculum that's been developed for uh, electricians and folks who are involved in the installs um, to get them familiar with those code requirement and other installation considerations um, that are important for electric vehicle infrastructure and chargers. Um, so I'll just say in, in closing, you know, apprenticeship is a big part of what we do. Workforce development is so important for these jobs um, and especially with the amount of federal dollars that are coming into Alaska here soon. Um, for infrastructure projects. And we really, really think it's important that um, the state of Alaska can prioritize and leverage dollars um, for those projects as well so that we can maximize the federal matching 
um, coming to the state uh, for those. And um, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions anyone has. I can also put my email in the chat as well if anyone would like to know more about anything uh, I mentioned today. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. So my next um, piece of the call to action is about buying locally. And the um, Buy Alaska program is another one of our um, generous um, co-hosts of this event. Every dollar spent at local businesses is three times more value retained in Alaska. So um, for example, if every Alaskan household spent $1,000 um, more at local businesses instead of um, outside businesses, that would bring an additional $103 million circulating um, in Alaska's economy, which would look like 5,850 jobs. So um, this can have some big impacts. The Buy Alaska directory is a great place um, to um, access um, more than 730 uh, businesses. Um, and the um, Buy Alaska is a um, program under the Alaska Small Business Development Center, which also provides some great um, support for um, folks who are looking to start their businesses. And um, they've been growing their online community, creating a platform to highlight uh, small businesses to a broad audience and build that sense of Alaskan pride um, that encourages local spending uh, and is also a source of information for um, local investing. And so they just recently launched this local investing corner um, as a place for Alaskans to connect and invest locally. And so it um, links to community supported farms and fisheries, Alaska's co-ops, local banks, and Alaskan businesses that you can invest in. So the Buy Alaska program is growing and it was seeking new partnerships um, to help support small businesses and grow economies in Alaska. So um, feel free to reach out um, at buyalaska.com to program manager Katie Ashbaugh. Next um, moment here is to pass to um, Kai um, to share a little bit about another one of our um, co-hosts, which is Alaska version three. And so I am um, looking, looking on my screen to see, oh yeah, you're already unmuted, I'll pass to you. Great, thanks. I was trying to turn my camera on too, but that's uh, blocked, but that's fine. So thanks for just a moment here. Alaska version three has been involved in a discussion over the last year with Alaskans talking about what is our next Alaska? What uh, is the next economy that would allow us to grow past the one we have? And uh, we're excited to be able to co-host this event. And we're involved in many of the, the complementary and, and similar issues we've got going on here. What I'd like to um, encourage you in particular to think about is the Innovation Summit that's gonna be held March 16th and 17th in Juneau. This is the 11th annual summit uh, that's um, hosted by the Juneau Economic Development Council. And this year we're bringing together many of the topics you've heard about today, the uh, regenerative tourism uh, uh, initiatives, the work you heard about in terms of the forest products and the Build Back Better grants, but we're also bringing a focus in particular to the emerging and transforming workforce in Alaska in these dynamic economic times. And we're encouraging people to engage in how innovation can be helping us address the challenges of workforce, but also many of these other issues. So thank you to all of the hosts for all you did to uh, uh, get through today and the presenters, and we're glad to co-host. And I hope you will, uh, if you're interested in this, go to akv3.com, sign up uh, for more information, join our discussions. But again, thank you for this uh, webinar today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kai. We really appreciate Oh, and there's your video on. We really appreciate that. Um, and the link to the Innovation Summit has been dropped in the chat, too. There are also upcoming opportunities to take action and ask the Alaska legislature to ensure that the incoming federal funding invests in a regenerative future. It's a once in a lifetime influx of federal fund federal funding that we're about to see. Um, and we've mentioned the ways that it can support broadband, that it can support uh, seeding more fertile soil for renewable energy. And this is one way uh, that we can guarantee there's transparency in public process and that this money goes to where Alaskans need it most. Um, House Bill 177, the Balance of Powers Act, prevents any governor without legislative approval from unilaterally spending large sums of federal money that flow into the state when the legislature is not in session which just means that our legislature will appropriately be involved in the way that this money is distributed under any governor's uh, term. 
Specifically, HB 177 will fix the statute to require legislative oversight and the balance of power as directed already by our Alaska Constitution. Uh, we must fix this provision of law now to uphold the Alaska Constitution and restore the full appropriation power to the state legislature. And so we're going to drop in the chat a sign on letter uh, that ensures um, that by passing HB 177, there will be more transparency and public process involved in the ways that we are able to fund uh, these new and exciting uh, industries. So now we are going to move to unfortunately a shortened time for our question and answer section. And so we ask that folks drop their questions uh, for our panelists into the chat now. Um, if anything came up for you and we're going to have the lovely Kay Brown um, help moderate through those questions. I think we'll probably have time for about two or three, but if any questions came up for you during the past hour and 15 minutes that we've spent together. I know I have so many curiosities. So now is the chance to get some good one-on-one -on -one time with our panels. We'll take a moment to give time for that. Really don't be shy. Any question is welcome. There we go. Uh, there are a couple of questions that came in earlier, so uh, I'll call on Ryan Witten. Would you like to ask your question? Are you still with us, Ryan? We are having a uh, that is really important. Hey, everyone. Um, I would just like to take a quick moment to say thank you for hosting the presentation that you have today um, and dealing with the adversity that you have. Um, you've handled it with grace, so thank you. Um, Paul, I've heard that there is the potential for a deep water port in Tionic or right across the inlet from Anchorage, which could significantly increase our ability to import and export goods from Alaska. I'm wondering if that is true, if you think that that could be a, a good location for such a, a port to exist. Um, just a curiosity at this point. Thank you. Yes, uh, well, that's been proposed for quite a while. The water is pretty shallow there. You've got to go over a mile offshore to get out to deep water at uh, Tionic. But uh, I, I have to take a look and see what other energy sources are there. I think in South Central here, they looked at, oh gosh, what was there was a volcano that they looked at close by here for tying into the grid. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. But, uh, you know, it's just money. It's about $30,000 foot, a $30, a linear foot. So for every hundred feet of dock, it's about $30 million. So if you don't have deep water fairly close to offshore, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to do it. Although it seems like there's a lot of money in this infrastructure bill. The most important thing you have to identify the need for the port, over. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, let's go to Hezekiah Holland, who has a question about how we can maintain our momentum. Oh, yeah, and, and, and that qu question is pretty broad uh, for, for anybody at this point, but uh, I really am excited about the work going on here and curious what the next steps are. Well, I can actually take up that question just very quickly so we have time for more that we uh, hope to that we've given you some inspiration with some of the calls to action that we've provided, including supporting um, local buying and buy Alaska, checking out HB 177, getting involved with uh, AKV3 and the Innovation Summit, and also joining the Alaska Climate Alliance Regenerative Economies Working Group if you want to keep up these conversations and stay informed. But additionally, we've also um, passed out the link to the survey. Um, that uh, we'll drop once more um, to join our mailing list and to continue collaborating on specific topics. And so this is, I, I hope, the first seed of a lot more yet to come. Uh, there's so much incredible work happening in all these sectors that I think that that's a good direction to point us all in so we can start to build and expand together. Maybe one or two more questions, Kay, please. Let's take a couple more. Um, Elise is asking if Mark could expand on the numbers he has worked up in moving to the transition and perhaps a summary of the ideas today along with the best timing of various projects getting started. 
Do you have a link we might study and promote? Mark, are you there? Yeah, I think the short answer is the final report is in development. And as soon as that's available, we'll send a copy out. All right. And you got a bit of an answer in the chat as well, at least from Erin McKittrick, panelist as well. Can we um, have a copy of your chat? Yes, all the links and information that's in the chat will be shared out after this webinar. Thanks. Um, Kitty Farnham is asking, Paul, how significant large is Alaska's potential supply of hydrogen fuel for exports globally using green and perhaps also blue hydrogen production? Well, I'm checking in with my assistant here, and he says that uh, the U.S. Geological Survey says there's four quadrillion BTUs of uh, energy uh, out in the Aleutians, and Mount Spur was the one that was nearby here. So, uh, you know, it, it's potential huge production of it, and uh, part of my study is really to identify the end markets for that. Uh, Asia is really interested in it. They're making the transition. But again, they say, where is the reliable supply? They've shut down almost all their nuclear reactors because of the uh, Fukushima disaster. So, you know, they don't really have that many other sources of how to make energy. So that's why, you know, the potential for this is just huge. So uh, that's part of my study is really to identify those end markets because those are the people that are going to end up paying for it. But it looks like right now, because of being able to use these renewable sources, like I said, three and a half to six cents a kilowatt hour. So the, the project that's going in at uh, Dutch Harbor on Alaska, that's 35 megawatts. By comparison, uh, the uh, uh, hydroelectric project down in Homer is 45 megawatts. So it's as much as that huge you know, dam down there uh, with uh, just one project out there. So. Anyway, the, the, uh, the exports could be huge and people want it and they're looking at this as a real, like an energy carrier. That's, what, that's been the holy grail with this whole alternative energy and, and renewable energy is how do you export it? How do you turn it into a product that can actually be used? Uh, if, and almost all the rest of the energy we're using for like electric grids for cities and things like that. So that, that's why we have really high hopes for this project in the Aleutians, over. Thank you. We probably have time for about one more question. So we'll go to the one post by Dave Rees on workforce development and uh, see if Ryan can respond. Um, workforce development starts with K-12 schools. How are these ideas getting to our young folks? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kay. And thanks for the great question, Dave. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I know that uh, the IBW, we have a really, really strong uh, partnership with uh, several districts around the state, and um, we take every opportunity that we can um, in order to get into those schools, you know, middle high school level, um, and sometimes even younger, and just plant the seed and make sure that they know that there are other options out there um, for them in the construction industry, um, and that it's not a bad thing. You know, going to college is great if, if that's what you, you know, need to do in order to uh, do the job that you would like to have, but um, we, we'd like folks to know, and young kids especially, to know that um, there are other opportunities out there, and so it's really, really um, something that I'm pretty proud of, and I, I really like doing, um, is being invited to those uh, career fairs and the uh, schools themselves, um, getting into the classrooms and talking with those kids um, about it. One other thing I'll add just really quickly, um, one thing that we're also really proud of uh, we partner with a couple of different districts um, around the state. And I'll, as an example, um, here in Anchorage, um, the King Career Center, or what's now known as King Tech High School, um, we have historically taken in one or two of those uh, top students in their uh, electricity course, and we direct enter them into our apprenticeship program. So it's a tremendous opportunity for someone coming out of high school to get right into a trade um, earn while you learn, and uh, they've got, you know, that certification when they end our apprenticeship. So, um, yeah, I agree 100%, and, and we do it as much as we can to get in those schools. So thanks again for the question. Thank you. And if we didn't get to your question, 
We encourage you to fill out the survey that was posted and give us your information. And uh, you can put your question in the survey or we will take it off the chat and attempt to get back to you follow as a follow-up. So thanks everyone. And thank you, Kay, for moderating that for us. So man, I invite everyone just to take a big deep breath and roll your shoulders back after an hour and a half staring at our computers, dealing with the things we dealt with, but also receiving so much joyful, beautiful information. Make sure that you're tending to your body as we move away from uh, this community time. As we wrap up the space, I wanna send the biggest thanks to our presenters and to our co-hosts for this event. Uh, links to more information have been shared in the chat as you've seen, and we hope that you take advantage of these action items to continue your involvement in creating a prosperous future for Alaska. Um, this recording and the chat will be shared out. We will redact the interruptions, and we hope that you revisit this wealth of information and inspiration. What I suggest as well is, um, keeping the conversation going on the Facebook page, the Facebook event. So if you have outstanding questions that weren't yet answered, uh, as Kay said, you can drop them in the survey that went out. But you can also uh, drop them in the comments of this recording that will be up uh, and our panelists will have a chance to connect there. Um, and I just also have to say, I am so proud of our community. I'm proud of each of you. I'm proud to be a part of this group of people who are steadfast and patient and undeterred in the face of opposition and discouragements. Uh, we are stronger for it. We're stronger together. And truthfully, we know that this vision will have opposition. Our vision will be opposed by those who have benefited from the misogyny and homophobia and hatred that we saw today and do not want to be held to just systems like the ones we will form. We'll be opposed by those who have filled their pockets by exploiting our workers. We'll be opposed by those who have profited from polluting our lands and waters and have succeeded only by undermining our economy and democracy. They are here uh, because we offer a future that they cannot exploit and abuse. So Zoom bombers alike, bring it on because it's a sign that we're doing this right. Uh, we're here to be the community that we deserve and we will see Alaska to a prosperous future. So thank you all for being here with us today. Margie, turn it to you for any closing words. I'm scared to say anything because you said it all so, so well just now, but I just have to share such deep gratitude for the incredible team that put on this um, webinar. And there's so many people in addition to the official co-hosts who have made this possible. And on behalf of the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition and Native Movement and um, all of the many networks and partners, I'm really, um, just humbled to have had the amount of interest um, in this webinar, to have exceeded my humble um, Zoom platform capability and to have filled this space um, with such vision. Um, as um, a lifelong Alaskan, I feel so grateful to um, be part of building a future um, so that generations to come can enjoy the incredible quality of life and uh, perspective that I think we all really value um, living here. And um, thank you, Ruth, for so graciously um, being a co-host and rooting us um, so, so, so well throughout. Yeah, I had, I had full, full chills um, when you were speaking just now at the end. And um, just, this is the beginning. And so please do take that survey. I will personally be delighted to correspond with you all um, and, and help weave this together into a movement for Alaska's future um, that we can all be really proud to leave to future generations. And so thank you to all the friends and new friends uh, for being here. Chinan, Kunoshish, Koyana, thank you.